Welcome to The Thriving Christian Artist, the podcast where we hope you connect with God to bust through the roadblocks that have held you back for years, create the work you love, and really live the life you know God created you to live as an artist in His kingdom. I'm Matt Tama, your host. Let's get started. Well, hey there. I'm so glad that you're with me on the podcast today. I've got my friend, artist Mary Martin, who is here with me. And Mary, what a joy to have you on the podcast today. Thanks, man. I'm really excited to be here. Absolutely. You know, we were just kind of talking beforehand. It's wonderful to talk to artists who are right in the middle of seeing uh, their art career and their relationship with the Lord just flourish and really stepping into everything that he has for them. And when I think of somebody like that, I think of you. I'm watching you on Facebook and on social media, and you've come to so many of our conferences over the years. And every time we connect or I get a note from you or something else. It's like, there's a new thing happening. There's a new thing happening. And I'm just so excited for you to be able to, to share your story with people today. Well, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So take us back, you know, I guess even before we do that, maybe just a little bit right now, what you're doing, um, what's the focus of your art, your art practice, that sort of thing. And then let's rewind the tape and, uh, and talk about how you actually got into doing what you're doing now. Well, the focus of my art right now is peace. Mm. Uh, as I've gone through my life, I've just gone back and seen how things have gone along. And I really realized that I am a peacemaker. Wow. So recently, um, I've just really been exploring that and things that I like to do in my past. Uh, one of them was origami. Mm. And there are peace cranes and peace doves within origami. So I've been doing this peace project that started on International Day of Peace, where Every day on social media, I'm posting an image of a piece dove or crane that I have folded out of papers that I have painted um, with this gel printing plate technique wow. that I've been playing with. And then I'm matching it with a saying about peace, whether it comes from scripture or a thought leader or someone like Martin Luther King or John F. Kennedy. Mm. Who, um, peace has been an impact for. How um, wonderful. Yeah. So do you always lean to kind of that more mixed media end of things where I know like for myself, it's like, as soon as I get introduced to a new medium, it's like, I love you. I want to do a new project with you. <laughs> so, are you like that? <laughs> yes, very much so. But uh, I've always loved paper, uh, uh, whatever kind of paper it is, watercolor paper or rice paper or tissue paper. And uh, all of the stuff you see in the background is, uh, has been done with tissue paper, not completely, but that's uh, a main focus. And I, I like the fluid acrylics and inks, like uh, the Sumi inks. Yeah. So that, that Japanese influence um, is big for me. Absolutely. So roll back the tape just as a kid growing up, teenager, early adult, was art a part of your life, always been a part of your journey? and Always. Um, yeah. 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 So I always thought of myself as creative and artistic, but not necessarily an artist back uh -huh. then. But I grew up in a household where there was always art supplies available, um, you know, crayons and paper and, you know, just whatever. Um, and my mom was, uh, I, would, I would consider her on the fiber artist end. Um, she was, uh, so, she sewed and she uh, knitted and she taught me how to do those things. Mm. And then my dad was very artistic as well. And he, um, he drew a lot, uh, but his main medium over the years ended up being uh, glass he does the uh, stained glass, um, art glass, the leaded stuff initially, yeah. and then he moved into doing like stepping stones and all this glass applique stuff. And so I have, I have lots of his things, as do most of my siblings. Uh, but he was probably my biggest influence as far as art as a kid, because he was always taking classes, going mm. to the community college, doing, um, he did ceramics, he did glass blowing at one point. So he was, he was always, you know, trying to find new stuff to do. And so kind of followed in his footsteps. So I, um, I knitted, sewed, cross-stitched. That stuff was always in my, um, in my arsenal of things. And then um, anything to do with paper. I think for so many of us, our, our, our art was uh, better caught than taught, right? I mean, it's like my mom and dad were both musicians and I was around it all the time and creativity and courage. And it's just kind of like what you did. So that sounds like very much how how you grew up as well. So. Yeah. Well, I also had the benefit of living in a city with a free art museum. So I grew up in St. Louis, which is where I still live. So we went to the art museum a lot when I was a kid and mom and dad always took us to art fairs. 
So I was one of those kids, well, you know, I would look at the things that people had for sale at the art fair, instead of asking my parents to buy me those things, I'd say, hey, I want to make that. So, <laughs> so they'd get me the stuff that I needed to make what I wanted to make. So I was That's always awesome. a maker in, in that. As a young person, did you ever have a context for being an artist uh, as a vocation or something? I know for me, I did not. And so when the Lord began to kind of awaken that part of me, I was like, what does that even look like? Is that possible? So, Well, from seeing people at art fairs, I knew that it was a possibility, but it wasn't necessarily on my radar that mm. I was going to be an artist, but I just always had that artistic, you know, creative vein in me. And I took an art class in high school thinking, oh, well, you know, maybe this is something I could pursue, but the teacher wasn't very encouraging. And so I figured, well, she's the high school art teacher, so she must know something I don't know. But mm. it never kept me from creating. And at that point, I already knew that I was going to be a physical therapist. Mm. And so that's where my journey took me. Uh, so I've, I've been pretty much a full-time working physical therapist since the age of 22, and I've been self-employed for 15 years wow. uh, doing that. You know, so. I think it's so important for people to realize that whether you are selling your work or it's part-time or full-time or you're doing it as a hobby or whatever, that, that you get money or don't get money from your art does not define you as an artist. And I think most of us live a lot of our life just doing art because we love it. And a lot of times the reason we end up selling it is because we have garages full of... <laughs> <laughs> of stuff that we need to get rid of that we need to start moving in order mm -hmm. to you know continue to fund our habit if you will and it's it's that beautiful you know example of stewardship that as we take what's in our hand and and steward that well god begins to give us more and give growth in that but i just i love that that you know you've been able to to keep your art in that place and still work full time and i know you're selling your work now and that sort of thing but did you ever feel that that pull of gosh, if I don't sell my work, this is not valid or, you know, just any of the fears and, and struggles with that? No, I, I was never really there, but kind of how I, how I even got to considering myself an artist was um, within my PT practice, I share mm. office space with another therapist and she has a patient who uh, is an art, a local artist here in the, in the St. Louis, St. Charles area. And uh, their agreement had always been a barter. So the artist would come in and get treatment and then uh, she would give the therapist art in return. Oh, wow. But one day she decided that her therapist needed to learn how to paint. <laughs> and my ears perked up and I said, um, can I get in on that bar? Right. <laughs> and she was very generous and allowed me to do that with her. So what we would do, she'd come in on a Tuesday at 10 o'clock and get her treatment. And then we'd shut down the office for two hours and we'd get our art lesson. How awesome. And, yeah. And that went on uh, probably average, maybe two times a month or so for about seven years. So I had private instruction all that time, which was, which was really nice. And wow. she started off very kind of realistically and, you know, drawing and neither of us really kind of took to that. And she was like, okay, let's go a, a different direction. And that's when she started teaching us collage work and, uh, you know, painting all these different papers. And, and that's, that's where I really sparked and, and got into to doing things along those lines. Wow. That's awesome. Now, yeah. as you think about, you know, your journey goes on this podcast, obviously we're talking to mostly Christian artists who love Jesus, want to see that, you know, relationship with him and the voice of the Holy spirit integrated into their work. I, I always love to kind of ask where people are in that journey. Cause some people, you know, for, for, for many creators and makers, that's a very visceral sort of right now flowing with the Holy spirit as you create for others. It's sort of a well that gets filled and then they create out of that place, but it's not necessarily something where they feel like they're moving every moment, you know, with the voice of the Holy spirit. So how does that work in your process? And I'd love to know even how did you begin to even realize that God wanted to use your creativity as a way to, to move in and with you? Well, as we were doing these art lessons, this is like back in 2005 was when I started. And so somewhere along in 2006, I was doing my morning prayer time and still small voice inside said, write. I'm like, mm. okay, well, what do you want me to write? So I just went out at lunchtime and took a journal and just started writing and kind of opened the eyes of my heart. Lord, what do you want, you know, what do you want me to write about? 
Yeah. And just kind of started writing. And then the writing turned into these little doodles that looked like angels. Wow. And so it was like, okay. So I spent uh, probably about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so just doodling like that. And I'm like, oh, I need to do this more. So the next day I went out, bought a sketchbook, actually two, just little ones. And I sat there at lunchtime and just doodled constantly. It'd be like page after page after page of this. Wow. And I'm like, what do I do with these things? And so that's when my art teacher said, well, we need to get color on these. And so I started playing with that. And then as, as I continued to explore that a little bit more, um, at that same time, I was reading a book by a Japanese researcher. Uh, his name's Masaru Emoto. It's called mm. The Hidden Messages in Water. Mm. And he would, uh, he would take crystals of water or you know, he would take water and freeze it and then photograph it just as it would form its crystal. And he started noticing that different water sources or things that um, he had taken them from, some of them would make really pretty crystals and others would not. And so he started trying to figure out what's going on with this. And so he started exposing the water to different words like love and joy and peace. And, and he would just get these gorgeous crystals and when he would expose it to words like, I hate you, or you're stupid, or I want to kill you, or it, the, the crystals j j just barely form. Wow. And then he started exposing it to uh, music like Chopin and you know, um, Mozart, and Beethoven, and just really beautiful music. And again, the same thing would happen. He'd get these gorgeous crystals. And if it was like really uh, hard rock or something with like a really hard, deep driving bass beat or something like that, it just... It, um, it just didn't form as much like that, you know, wow. heavy metal, that sort of thing. And so I started thinking, okay, if beautiful words and beautiful music do this to water, what would scripture do to the water? Mm. So I started writing out scriptures. Like if, if there was a particular um, theme that I wanted to paint about, like peace or joy, I'd go and find a scripture about peace or joy and write it out on a piece of, of paper and put it into the water that I paint with. Is that oh, wow. a lot of the techniques that I use are, are, are wet. So I'll wet the, the surface of the paper first. And then I use the fluid acrylic paint. So then, uh, you know, the, you know the, there's a flow of the, the paint and mixed with the water. Right. right. That, and sometimes the paintings sort of paint themselves. Or I'll, I'll go into it with a certain intent and go back when different layers of it have dried. And I'll see pictures in it that I didn't necessarily intend. But that support the... Uh, support the scripture that I've written about. Wow. So that's one way that I work with the spirit to uh, paint my paintings. And then, um, you know, so sometimes I go in with no intent whatsoever as to what's going to show up, but I may start off with just doing, you know, turning on some praise and worship music and <laughs> doing a little prayer dance and then, right. and then going into it from there. Other times it's very intentional. Like uh, some of the paintings you see behind me right now, I had um, done for an exhibit that, um, was uh, oh, inspired by actually uh, um, an opera called Nabucco. Uh -huh. uh, it's about King Nebuchadnezzar and what was going on during the Babylonian captivity um, for the Jews. And so uh, there was a scripture about how um, they hung up their harps on the willows. Right. So the ones behind me are about the willows. And so I used... Um, that scripture in there, but also sort of the redemption of, you know, when the Lord back brought back the captives of Zion, we were like men and dreaming. So that's in there as well. So it's kind of a, just a way of, I don't know, bringing, bringing all of that together. Um, so I, I had very intentionally chosen those scriptures to put into uh, that painting. So they're not only um, written out and putting it into the water that I paint with, but they're also written on the paper itself. So it's wow. kind of part of the layers of, I actually wrote out the scriptures kind of to create some of the branches in the willows. I love that because I think so much of being an artist and, and creating and then releasing that is the mystery of God, what are you going to do with this and how are people going to respond? And so many times we, you know, over-engineer that and it's got to be like this. It's got to be like that. I love that just intuitive process that, Hey, I'm going to put this scripture in there and just let it go. And, you know, let the, let the scripture do what it's going to do. Let the inspiration of the Holy spirit do what it's going to do and let people respond. And so many times people see things in all of our work that are so far beyond what we could have ever, you know, uh, thought about or, or done intentionally. And I just love that, that, that what we do can be that 
vehicle for the Holy Spirit to move so beautifully. So, mm -hmm. well, you know, well, hey, there's Matt. And, you know, one of the things that I found over the years in working with artists is that real lasting change in our life happens best in the context of supportive Christian community. And that's why I wanted to take this opportunity just to take a second and invite you to be a part of my online community called the Thriving Christian Artists Facebook Group. Listen, this group is absolutely free and over the years has actually grown to thousands and thousands of artists in just about every creative medium from countries all over the world. You know, the cool thing is that it's become a real place of encouragement and life for artists, just like you and me, who want to share their work, share their life, <laughs> connect with other artists, and really pursue everything God has for us as artists in his kingdom. Now, listen, to join, all you have to do is just click the link in the show notes here and answer a couple of questions just to let us know that you're a real person, and bam, you're in, okay? So, listen, I can't wait to connect with you inside of my Thriving Christian Artist Facebook group. Do it now, and we'll see you there very soon. All right, bye. All of us kind of, I think, in our creative process, and not only our process, but just our creative life, run into roadblocks. Now, I know that you've never run into any roadblocks or had any difficulties whatsoever in your oh, life. No, so, that, <laughs> <laughs> But maybe, just maybe there were a couple of kids. As you've kind of started to come into uh, your own and really stepping into really thriving as an artist that, you know, that he's called you to be, what have been some of the, the major challenges that you've had to face uh, and, and overcome and, and maybe still working through in your life? Yeah, well, you know, once I decided that I really wanted to pursue this as um, not only just displaying my artwork, but also selling it, part of it is just finding the time or mm. making the time to create. And so uh, one of the things that I had to do for myself was carve out at least a day a week. So um, right now I'm working four days a week in my PT practice. And then um, Monday is my dedicated studio day. Mm. So that was one thing that I had to do is really be able to carve out that time. But uh, part of the challenge there was getting people to realize that, oh, I'm not off on Monday. They figure right. if I'm not in the PT office, then I'm not working. And so having to just set my boundaries and say, no, this is my studio day. I'm working in my art business. And as I have set that boundary, people have, people respect that now Yeah, um, that, that they know that I am working in my art business. And, uh, but you, know, you don't respect that time. Nobody else is right. I mean, right. that's huge. <laughs> so. Yeah. And you know, and there are times when I do have to fit other things in, if I can't work it into my work week, um, then you know, like a doctor's appointment or taking my dad to a doctor's appointment or things like that. Uh, you know, I, I will do that, but then I have to find other time during the week to be able to um, make up for the time that I didn't spend in the studio that day. Mm. And so I spend a lot of time on the weekends um, painting and, you know, doing all of the business end of, of the art business as well. Uh, and a lot of weeknights, but right. the other challenge has been, after, you know, it's, uh, I work with a chronic pain population, and so that and that's pretty challenging and can be kind of emotionally and physically exhausting. Yeah. So coming home after a full day of work and trying to switch gears and make myself go to the studio to create. Right. And so sometimes it's physically walking down the stairs to the studio. <laughs> you know, if I can get that far, yeah, you know, I, I can get moving. But um, sometimes it's it's an effort just to switch those gears to be able to have a creative output when I've been pulled on so hard during the day otherwise. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think one of the best things that I ever did was moving my studio from the house as my business began to grow. I was able to get a studio outside the house and it's, it's like when I'm here at the studio, I'm at the studio. And then when I'm home, I'm home. And I can remember when I was doing both, you know, back and forth and you are tired and you're like, Oh, can I do this? And, or, you know, being married, my wife's like, will you ever get out of the shed out there with you, please? <laughs> Come back in. You have a family, you know? And I'm like, I know, I know. But yeah. it's, all, it's always that balance. But I think developing that habit of, of creating studio time and, and making it personal for you, making it a priority for you, it does kind of raise a flag in your life and say, hey, guys, this is important. And it puts everybody in your life on notice. And even puts you on notice to say, okay, if I'm going to do this, this is part of that. And um, it's, it's just a huge, huge benefit. Um, and, and I think one that really separates people, the ones who kind of stay a hobbyist and the ones who really take their art 
to the next level is setting aside that studio time mm -hmm. um, to really to really create. So that's yeah. beautiful. Well, and, and I had the benefit of, you know, as I started uh, taking all these art lessons, my kids were in, I guess, uh, late grade school, early mm -hmm. high school. And by the time I decided that I was really going to pursue it, my youngest son had started college. Mm. So I don't have, you know, the kids pulling on. Yeah, sure. Phone. And one of the things, um, you know, <laughs> it's like you said, <laughs> your wife says, when are you coming out of the shed? Exactly. Like, <laughs> I, when I go down the basement, that is, that is my time away. But one of the things that I try to do, um, if I'm doing some of the business stuff where I'm on the computer or uh, where I don't have to be, you know, physically creating art, a lot of times I'll do that stuff <laughs> next to my husband. Yeah. Know, <laughs> you know, so that we're at least side by side in each other's physical presence, even though we may not be, you know, interacting so much, at least we're with each other. Exactly. Um, so that, uh, that's helpful. And uh, I also have the benefit of him being uh, very, very supportive of this uh, pursuit of my art. In fact, he builds all of my frames and oh, how great. Comes, yeah, it comes to, comes to all of my exhibits and, you know, there's, there's always that, uh, you know, it's nice to have that support <laughs> behind me. Yeah. I think for all of us that have, you know, that are married and, you know, have a spouse, it's so important for them to not necessarily be in the business or do what we do necessarily, but to be that supportive part because they bring, I just believe that when God brings people together in a marriage, as you lean into one another, you begin to receive the gift that is in that other person in greater measure. And I know for me, Tanya has been that along the way. She's now, you know, transitioning into working in our business more and more, but she sees things from a different perspective that I don't see. And she, you know, is able to think through things in a different way. And I don't know if you'd say the same about your husband, but that's just such a valuable resource and partnership to for somebody that's wanting to step into their art more fully yeah well and i have the advantage of he's he was a sales professional for many many years oh, wow and so i have that perspective behind because i may be doing something some way and he'll you know he'll throw his two cents worth in and it'll be like oh that's a good idea Let's exactly <laughs> you know so it, it's nice having that and he uh he was a writer as well so i have his proofreading skills <laughs> so very important so, very yeah important. so I'll, I'll write up an email to send out and i'll always run it past him you know is, is there anything in there that you know i need to change or whatever so i, I have that that's great that nice benefit too i know that your your art is not only part of what you're doing now as a you know part-time vocation but you're also uh, have, have been involved in your art as ministry as well have you found that to be a attention for you of knowing where to draw the line or where to give and where to charge or how does that balance work for you in your life Mary? You know, it, it's it's pretty much always been um, you know once I decided I was going to be an artist it, mm -hmm. it's pretty much always been for sale where it was as far as ministry was uh, I was involved in an arts program in uh, the local uh, Gateway House of Prayer here in St. Louis they had an arts program and so we would get together and do things as um a group doing book studies. And mm. that's where I came across unlocking the heart of the artist. I've heard of that somewhere. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and actually being involved in that arts group was really what kind of launched me. Cause I, mm. you know, I, I said, yeah, I'm going to do this. And I was selling things like it at, you know, my church craft fair and a couple, you know, little local things like that. Um, but being involved in this arts group, the arts director, who's John Grapperhouse, um, he, he saw in me that I was ready to start exhibiting before I thought I was. Mm. And uh, so he offered me a solo exhibit at the House of Prayer. In fact, it was the first one that they had uh, done other than, you know, people who were, uh, you know, part of the House of Prayer before. Wow. And, uh, and so that's really what, you know, that was one of those pivotal moments in my, <laughs> in my artistic career saying, oh. Somebody saw something in me before I saw it. And so, That's right. um, so I pursued that, but part of it was like, okay, so how do we do this? And it was like, um, I don't know. So I just started yeah. going online and looking for suggestions as to how do you run an art exhibit? And there's so much free, wonderful absolutely advice out there. And I think, you know, a lot of times you're talking about how people are always, you know, saying, Oh, I can't afford it. But if you go look for these free resources and utilize right. them, it's really beneficial. So, you know, I, I found all laid out on an artist, you know, um, an art blog 
here's how you do it, you know, in a, in a timeline. And so it's like, so I did it. <laughs> and, and, and it worked. <laughs> and, it worked. And, and people came and people bought my art and it was really wonderful. <laughs> That's awesome. I was just telling somebody the other day, I think that, you know, so many artists that start in the church get pigeonholed, not, you know, in a, I don't think anybody's doing it intentionally, but a lot of times they think that their art has to fit within the context of the local church only. And I think the place that the local church serves the artist best is to be that seed bed where seeds get planted and things get nurtured and they start to come to fruition, but they may not find their full, you know, culmination in the life of the church. They can bless the church, you know, but mm -hmm. they're, they're really for the marketplace. And I love just that part of your story that you were in a local body of people who were able to speak in to your life in the context of your relationship with the Lord. And yet that didn't limit you in any way that it really launched you into being able to do what you're doing now outside mm -hmm. the local church. And which is, which is just beautiful. So right. yeah, really good. well, you know, there's so many, I think listening today that'll be like, I'm right where she was five years ago, or, <laughs> you know, I would love to be there. What advice would you give to them as folks or maybe where you were five or 10 years ago and just kind of at the beginning of this journey or maybe right in the middle and just kind of feeling stuck and not sure how to really press through into, into seeing themselves start to really thrive as an artist. Yeah. Well, I think if you've made the decision that this is what you want to do, you just have to carve out the time to do it. Mm. And for me, it was, you know, just setting aside that Monday saying, okay, <laughs> I've got to do it then, but wherever it is, even if it's just, you know, one, one little spot during the week where you mm. say, this is when I'm going to do it, whether it's in the evening or wherever you can carve it out. Yeah. For me, for the longest time, I had to be up before the rest of the family. That was the only time I would get time for myself to do things. So, you know, you may have to sacrifice a little sleep or, yeah. or I, I, I don't really watch television anymore as far as sitting down and just, right. you know, watching TV. It may be on in the background for noise or right. just to kind of, you know, keep my mind occupied, but I don't just do, do that anymore. So that, right. you know, there may be those sort of things where you have to, to sacrifice something else to pursue, pursue the dream. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I think one of the biggest things for me is getting coaching, mm. uh, whether that is coaching from a blog online or um, actually participating in a program like created to thrive. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've participated in multiple ones. And I think it's really nice to have um, lots of different voices to pull Absolutely. from. Because one of the things you see is that there will be common threads all the way throughout, mm. uh, you know, as far as advice as to what, what to do. And there may be other, um, you know, one coach may have something that speaks to you more than another. That's right. Uh, Different area of expertise so, or passion exactly. or whatever. Right, right. right. Um, so I think that that's also really valuable, uh, because otherwise you're spinning your wheels, trying to figure out out on your own, if there's already people who know, <laughs> who have Absolutely. a pathway set out that if you just follow the steps, yeah. you move forward. And, uh, I think another thing that's been really beneficial for me has been an accountability partner. Um, uh, I had been to a coaching, um, out in, uh, Golden, Colorado, a couple of years ago, and the woman that I ended up rooming with, we became fast friends, and we've been accountability partners, and we talk to each other twice a month, and we lay out, uh, we have our goal list that here are the things we're working to accomplish this month, and then we just talk to each other twice a month, say, okay, how you doing? And it's encouragement, you know, yeah. if we haven't done our things or we're not as far along as we think we are, it's not like, um, you know, to give it to you give each other a hard time, but really very much for encouragement. And we've really seen ourselves progress in the last two years by doing this. Um, Absolutely. So I think it, it is good to have somebody uh, just to bounce ideas off of. And um, actually that's where, uh, I don't know if you've seen my new logo with my little piece origami piece dove on it. Um, I actually kind of came up with that through chatting with her because wow. she bounced, you know, as I was, talking about things that I wanted to do. She said, well, what about these things that you've been doing and helped me uh, put it together in that way? Yeah, it's so important, I think, for all of us to have other people in our life that we trust and love and we know they love us and mm -hmm. have our best interests at heart to, to be able to receive from them because I think that's 
so many artists feel so alone. They don't know anybody in their area or whatever that, you know, may is an artist and a believer, or they just don't have any way to, you know, really share that part of their journey. That's been, I think one of the greatest joys for me in Created to Thrive to see so many people from Podunk, wherever, you know, <laughs> that are able to connect with somebody else. And whether it's in a mastermind group or at a weekend, or like you said, on the phone twice a month or whatever, and just say, I see God in you. And this is important. And we want to fan the flame in each other and being able to remain teachable, I think through all of that and receive is just so, so important. And I can obviously see Mary, it's bearing fruit in your life. And I know others are being encouraged too by all of this. I'm sure people are going to want to connect with you. Tell us where the best place is on your website, social media, that place to uh, well, your my work. website is marymartinartstudio.com. Uh, I'm on Instagram, also at Mary Martin Art Studio. And on Facebook, I'm at Mary D. Martin Art. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Mary, thank you so much for being on today. And if you're listening to the podcast, definitely check Mary out. And uh, wherever your social media interests may take you, <laughs> there's so many nowadays. And um, definitely share her work and just encourage her and in her walk. So Mary, thanks a lot for being on today. Thanks, Matt. Hey, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with me today on the podcast. Listen, I hope it's been a huge encouragement to you on your journey as an artist. Hey, also, before you leave, make sure to hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of the other episodes of the Thriving Christian Artist Podcast. And also be sure to connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, or at my website, which is matttommymentoring.com. Until next time, remember, you were created to thrive. Bye-bye.